The recent Disrupt Land Forces protest, which was called to create chaos for the weapons manufacturers and their customers gathered at the Melbourne Convention and Exhibition Centre, got underway on September the 11th. The date and the attempt at mass disruption reminded many people of another September the 11th, one that took place in pretty much the same part of Melbourne in 2000, over three days of mass protest against the World Economic Forum, a mobilisation which became known as S11. Disrupt Land Forces activists have come under heavy attack by the police and the media. The cops are still trying to track down activists to charge them. But the attempts at disruption were completely justified. As protest spokesperson Natalie Farah said before the event, Land Forces is a one-stop genocide shop. And she continued, There are going to be generals from the Australian Army and many others from around the world, and they're going to be meeting with the CEOs of multiple weapons and engineering companies, as well as diplomats and defence ministers. These people are going to be having conversations and making deals that are going to cause massacres and result in the deaths of thousands of people. But while the protests against land forces were important, and socialists were there, and we stand with the many brave and dedicated activists against police and media repression, the outcome was very different from S11 in 2000. Back then, activists mobilised 10,000 people on the first day, and 20,000 over the three days of the protest, including a mass union rally. This time, numbers at the largest event were about 1,500, and the protests were politically much narrower in their composition, with most activists from autonomous groupings or the far left. So why the big difference? Why did S11 score a victory over the World Economic Forum, where disrupt land forces failed to make a serious dent in the warmongers' festival of death? The answer, I would argue, is to be found in different approaches to disruptive action and the different theories that underpin them. You're listening to The Sound of Solidarity, brought to you by Solidarity. We're a revolutionary socialist group in Australia, and if you'd like to find out more about us, our website is solidarity.net.au. I'm David Glanz, and I'm recording this episode on unceded Wurundjeri land in Narm or Melbourne. Look, our rulers and their media hate direct action. It threatens their status quo, it shakes up their comfortable existence, and it confirms that there's more to politics and changing the world than voting for a parliamentary sideshow. That's why solidarity supports direct action. But there's more than one approach to making it happen. Revolutionary socialists want to help organise and take part in direct action that does three things. First, by mobilising masses of people, It sends a clear warning to our rulers that we reject their policies. It also pushes the issue into mainstream debate, reaching much wider numbers of people than the activists themselves. Second, the mass action itself raises the confidence of those taking part and lays the basis for further mobilisations. And third, the action either draws in organised workers or at least opens up the possibility of working-class action, action that can hit the boss's profits and their wars at their source. By contrast, the organisers of Disrupt Land Forces argued that celebrating the diversity of the movement was more important than a united mass protest. Having one mass mobilisation was dismissed as somehow implicitly authoritarian, Instead, so-called autonomous groups were encouraged to organise how and when they chose. To quote Natalie Farah again, There are a lot of different events that are going to be happening throughout the week. That's of the week of Disrupt Land Forces. Our mobilisation begins a few days before and a couple of days after the expo, and that's because it's more than just protesting outside the exhibition itself. To get a sense of how different approaches to direct action can impact the struggle, just look at organising for Palestine at the University of Melbourne this year. On the one hand, a group of black bloc anarchists 
invaded the university's main library one night, trashed it and covered the doors and windows in slogans in support of Palestine. The action was secret, involved no one outside of a tiny organising group and resulted in the library being shut for about five days. That pissed off students who needed to use the library and the action didn't bring a single additional student into the struggle. And it also pissed off library staff, most of them members of the NTU union who support Palestine, including casual staff who lost pay while the library was being repaired. By contrast, the four-week encampment that was organised by students who were mobilising for Palestine was organised openly and democratically. Activists reached out to students and staff to get involved. There were lunchtime rallies and marches with speakers from the NTEU alongside Palestinian and Jewish activists and Green MPs and some of them attracted 500 people. That laid the basis for a history-making mass occupation of a university building that was renamed Mahmoud's Hall, an occupation that lasted for a week despite management bluster and threats. When the university tried to break the occupation, the campus NTU branch called on its members to attend and form a barrier protecting the building. And when the university cracked and agreed to outline its military links, the result vindicated the open mass approach. It enthused students and union members and laid the basis for further organising in the second half of the year. And the university tried to discipline some of those students. There was significant solidarity from the NTU, a march of hundreds to the disciplinary hearing, and essentially the students were let off with little more than a, a caution. So what's this got to do with S11? S11 was successful because activists organised openly and democratically and reached out to unions and their members, to members of the Labour Party and the Greens and across the broad left. It embraced direct action but adopted the model that involved and raised the confidence of participants rather than reducing them to being spectators of actions carried out by a supposedly more radical minority. I'll outline what happened, but first I'll give you some background. In much the same way that global politics today is shaped by the issue of Palestine, at the end of the 1990s, the issue that was galvanising activists around the world was globalisation, the push by the rich countries for free trade on their terms. It was linked to the destruction of industries, privatisation and asset stripping by the global rich. The result was a global wave of protest, usually seen as starting in Seattle in the United States on the 30th of November 1999, in opposition to the World Trade Organization. That rally brought together what was known at the time as Teamsters and Turtles, meaning union members, Teamsters are a major union in the US, who were worried about job losses and environmentalists concerned about further rampant destruction of nature. And once Seattle happened, and it was very disruptive to those attending the WTO, rallies spread quickly to Vienna, Washington DC, Windsor in Canada, Okinawa, and so on. And then it was our turn, here in Melbourne, here in Australia. The World Economic Forum announced it would hold a regional meeting in Melbourne over three days, starting on the 11th of September 2000. That would bring together Australia's top bosses with their counterparts from the Asia-Pacific to schmooze and talk business and anti-worker tactics. How we responded from the get-go mattered. At the first organising meeting, some activists wanted to select an organising committee and essentially send the rest of us away to await instructions. The focus was going to be more on a counter-conference than a protest. But many of us who had been inspired by Seattle said we wanted open democratic organising meetings with a view to mobilising many thousands for a mass rally on the event's opening day. And that position won the day. A mass blockade was on the agenda from the very beginning. We had plenty of experience in mass mobilisations to build on. In 1998, thousands had taken part in mass pickets at the waterfront 
to defend the Maritime Union of Australia from the Liberal government's union-busting tactics. And in 1999, thousands more flooded onto the streets in defence of Timor-Leste, on the brink of gaining its independence from Indonesia. And throughout this period, there were continuous mass mobilisations against Pauline Hanson and her One Nation Party, then very new on the scene and very prominent in pushing a racist agenda. The S11 Alliance had weekly organising meetings in Melbourne and there were normally a hundred or more people there. Lots of debate. We consciously reached out to unionists, Labour members, Greens, community groups and more. Not just in Melbourne, but across the country. The argument was that we all had a common interest in stopping what we would nowadays call the neoliberal attacks. And people organised everywhere. Activists came from every capital city and many regional centres. We were helped with the beginnings of the internet. S11 Alliance had a website and everybody found that very fascinating. It was something very new. It helped get the message out into the nooks and crannies uh, of Australia. And the support was, was serious. The Manufacturing Workers Union, the AMWU in Adelaide, for instance, booked out a train carriage for a contingent of its members and left-wing activists. So as S11 approached, we felt we could tell the media with confidence that we expected 10,000 people to surround the venue for the conference. Crown Towers with its neighbouring casino on the south bank of the Yarra. And look, later on we discovered that we'd had a police spy in our ranks throughout, and it didn't make a damn bit of difference. Nothing she could pass on to her bosses could stop 10,000 determined people from shutting down the World Economic Forum. And that's exactly what we did. On the morning of September the 11th, we surrounded the complex. There were huge crowds on every gate. Hundreds surrounded the car of WA Liberal Premier Richard Court, while an Aboriginal activist danced on the car roof. Court was so arrogant, he thought he could just drive through the blockade, and he learnt a lesson that day. Prime Minister John Howard made it in, but only by boat. Every land entrance was pretty much sealed tight on that first day. A major event with Howard and Bill Gates at the Convention Centre, yes, the same building where Land Forces was held, was cancelled. David Armstrong, who was then editor-in-chief of the Australian newspaper, told how he and others trying to break the blockade, spent six hours on a bus driving through Melbourne. The Odyssey finished at Port Melbourne, where passengers boarded a barge. But, he later reported, the tide was high and we couldn't get under the bridge at Spencer Street. So the WEF forum opened with rows and rows of empty seats. Pretty much only those who had stayed in the Crown Hotel overnight could turn up. And yes, there was room for diversity among the protesters, even while we standed united in our mass blockade. Some made giant puppets, some offered first aid or legal observation, some ran independent media, but everyone was there to make the blockade effective. Now the truth is, the story was a tad more complicated when it came to the unions. ACTU President Sharon Burrow shamefully defied the blockade to speak to the WEF. That was an appalling decision. But the Victorian Trades Hall Council knew it had to mobilise for S11. The pressure of many of its affiliated unions worried about the impact of so-called free trade and of the movement itself ensured that. But they were also nervous, given the media scare campaign, that we protesters were going to wreak violence and destruction on Melbourne. So they announced that there would be a march of striking workers on the 12th of September, but that it would stop on the north bank of the river, opposite Crown. But you know, they couldn't hold that line. As the movement and the momentum grew in the days before S11, Trades Hall buckled, they announced that they would march to Crown on the south bank after all. The movement pretty much pulled the Union supporters across the river. Estimates vary but at least 5,000 to 8,000 workers marched to join the protest, on strike, 
helping swell overall numbers for the three days to around the 20,000 mark. S11 itself was a clear-cut success. We gathered enormous media coverage, locally, nationally and internationally. We gave people a sense of their own power. But Labour Premier Steve Brax gave the green light for the cops to go in hard on the 12th. The Labour government, the organisers of the WEF and the police had been humiliated by S11 and they were going to get revenge. And the cops went in really hard, but only early in the morning and late in the afternoon when numbers were lower and the media wasn't around. The police log late on S11 recorded, and I quote, Breakfast tomorrow, delegates to leave hotels by 0700, to be at Crown by 0715, by whatever force necessary. And the force was overwhelming and pitiless. Hundreds of police beat their way through protesters on the morning and evening of S12. On the first day, ambulance workers had taken four protesters to hospital. On S12, the second day, the number was 16. Brax called us fascists, yet there were many ALP members amongst the protesters. His own branch, Williamstown, condemned his comments, as did Trades Hall. Brax chose the wrong side of history. Despite the police violence, the blockade held more or less on the second and third days. And as we called it to a halt on the third day, we marched into the city in a proud parade. And I'm not making this up. We were applauded by shoppers and office workers along our route. Although the media had savaged us, the message that we were protesting against the corporations who were feasting off the misery of all of us had got through. It was further evidence that S11 protesters had won. So how did S11 measure up against those three criteria that I mentioned at the beginning? First, it mobilised tens of thousands. There was disruption, impact and radicalisation on a significant scale. The political class and the media couldn't ignore us and what we were saying. And despite sections of the media treating us like criminals, our arguments got out in part or whole to hundreds of thousands. Who knows, even more around the country. Second, the mass action raised the confidence of those taking part and laid the basis for further mobilisations. S11 fed into a global wave of revolt. Our blockade became the latest link in the chain of rebellion. One manifestation of this was a series of world social forums that brought together tens of thousands of activists from the global south and the industrialised world. I had the privilege of attending the World Social Forum in Mumbai. It was awe-inspiring to see poor people, activists, workers, all kinds of community organisations and protesters coming together in tens of thousands and debating ideas, marching and celebrating together. And later on, we did hold a modest Melbourne Social Forum. More significantly, those who had taken action at S11 were in the forefront of the anti-war movement that emerged after the 9-11 attacks in the US the following year. And on the weekend of February the 14th to the 16th, 2003, as the US and Australia and Britain were getting ready to invade Iraq, maybe a million people took to the streets of Australia against that impending war, part of the largest global mobilisation in human history. S11 acted as a transmission belt of activism that took people from earlier defence of unions and Timor-Leste and anti-racist action into the largest anti-war movement the world has ever seen. And third, the action drew in organised workers who struck in their thousands to march to the blockade. It didn't end there. Construction workers in the CFMEU in Perth, who were working on the Bell Tower site, which was then the city's flagship project, went on strike for three days in outrage at the way riot police had bludgeoned their way to Premier Richard Court's rescue. Remember Richard Court in his car, surrounded by hundreds of protesters, with an Aboriginal activist dancing on the roof. 
The following year, construction workers in Melbourne struck on May Day, the 1st of May, which fell on a weekday that year, and that was the first time there'd been a May the 1st weekday strike in Melbourne since 1945. So the conclusion is simple. S11 showed how direct action could be successful and inspire new struggles. We need to apply those lessons again today.